whenever you have something really cold and then you get this short, sharp kind of sensation, that's sensitivity. It can get worse. The problem is not going to go away by itself. I always recommend Sensodyne. It's specially designed to care for their sensitivity. And I've had people coming back to me saying it's made a difference. It works. Whenever you have something really cold and then you get this short, sharp kind of sensation, that's sensitivity. It can get worse. The problem is not going to go away by itself. I always recommend Sensodyne. It's specially designed to care for their sensitivity. And I've had people coming back to me saying it's made a difference. It works. Whenever you have something really cold and then you Good evening. I am Dr. Kanyi Makwakwa, SADA National License Officer. My major role at SADA is to be the link between the World Dental Federation and SADA. Professionally, I'm a specialist in community dentistry and I work at Sefako Makato Health Science University at the School of Oral Health Sciences. On the 20th of March this year, we celebrated World Oral Health Day. Now we celebrate World Oral Health Day every year on the 20th of March. The campaign started in 2013, and this saw us now having a three year uh, theme. The first theme was in 2021, uh, as, as, as the theme is to be proud of your mouth in 2021. The focus was on how oral health affects our overall health. In 2022, was to highlight how a healthy mouth is important for our happiness and well being. In 2023, we focus on the importance of caring for your mouth at every stage of your life. So, World Oral Health Day is a global campaign, and we ask the world to unite to help reduce the burden of oral diseases which affect individuals, health systems, and economies everywhere. World Oral Health Day aims to empower people with knowledge, tools, and confidence to secure good oral health. I am joined here in the webinar by three beautiful ladies. And as we started with the advert, I would like to thank our sponsor from Sensodyne and Ms. Marcel Erasmus, who is the one representing the brand. I will read her short her bio. Uh, she is head of Expert South Africa, uh, Hellion Consumer Healthcare South Africa, member of the Hellion Group. In, she is enthusiast, an enthusiastic achiever with 17 years experience in the pharmaceutical and consumer health industry, strong, has strong organizational leadership, problem solving, strategic planning, and analytical skills. Diligent, proven contributor, often managing multiple projects concurrently in high pressure situations, actively partnering with all levels of leadership and cross-functional, coordinating with a dynamic sales and marketing team to help deliver results in a competitive commercial environment, skilled in various disciplines of operations, sales, and marketing. I now introduce Ms. Marcel Erasmus. Thanks very much, Dr. Makwakwa. Nice introduction. Good evening and welcome, dental <laughs> health professionals. GSK Consumer South Africa is a member of the Halion Group, and we are focused on increasing awareness on consumer health and wellness, growing self-care in the face of increased pressure on public health care system and unmet consumer needs. With our strong product portfolio of brands, which includes, as you know, Sensodyne just mentioned, um, as well as Aquafresh and Paradontex. We have a other range of OPC and wellness products as well. But for this session, we focus on the oral health care portfolio. We are committed to continue to develop more distinctive brands, which is focused on deep human understanding and the trusted science. 
we want people to value and really take care of their oral health by making the right decisions to protect their oral health. We've partnered with the FDI World Dental Federation globally for World Oral Health Day to help and empower people with the knowledge and confidence to secure good oral health. We want to inspire change, and by inspiring change, we want this year to focus on the importance of oral health at every stage of life. Because not mad, no matter what age you are, caring for your mouth and looking after your oral health is important. We will be conducting in regions like KZN, the Western Cape and Gauteng, chill test activations, as well as educational awareness drives. And that will be focused on sensitivity in clinics and hospitals. We are very honored to join the partnership with SADA on the outreach programs to educate individuals on the importance of good oral health. <clears throat> Collectively and with your continued support, we will reach more people and educate them on the vital importance of good oral health and what the role it, in the role it plays in everyday health and well-being. So with that, um, thank you, Dr. Makwakwa. Thank you so much, Marcel. And I think we're very privileged uh, to have your support in South Africa as SADA, as you are one of the World Oral Health Day FDI partners. So we really appreciate your presence and your continued support through the branches. Thank now you. we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Ms. Elda van der Ham, who's going to focus. As, as you heard, Marcel was saying that we need to make sure that every stage of our lives, we keep good oral health. So she's going to focus on how we ensure that. So I'll have a short bio for uh, Elda. She is an oral hygienist who qualified from the University of Stellenbosch in 1977. She does not look a, a day over certain ages. Uh, she holds a diploma in oral hygiene and has subsequently done extended functions in oral hygiene. Currently, she's studying at an American Academy in Biological Oral Hygiene. She has been working in private practice for 45 years. Her focus has been in periodontics and implantology, and she's currently employed by Enamel Clinic, a, a unique polyclinic with all the various specialities under the umbrella. Since 2014, she has been an international ITOP instructor for Curidan Academy in Switzerland. She has presented at various national and international conferences. She served as OHASA president for two terms and served on local and national committees for the association. Uh, we welcome Ms. Elna van der Ham. Thank you. Hi, Elna. Could you yeah. kindly switch on your mic? I know, sorry about that. So, um, Ms. McWakwa, thank you for the introduction and thank you to SADA and to Sensodyne for hosting this, this webinar on this very special day. I'm going to share my screen with you. Is that okay? Okay. It's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. So the theme this year is to be proud of your mouth um, for a lifetime of smiles. And um, as we heard in the introduction there, um, it's every year on the 20th of March. And um, Ms. Makwakwa has gone through the, the whole idea behind this is to help reduce the burden of oral disease worldwide. So... Um, be inspired. So that's, um, sorry, I just want to go take this down. So inspiring change is on the importance of oral health at every stage of life, because no matter what age you are, caring for your mouth and your oral health is very important. And so I have seen patients literally starting from when they first come to the oral hygienist and when they get married and they have their babies, so we try and build a relationship. So the comprehensive oral care system is really what we're aiming for, to maintain that continuum from birth to death. So we have to work with the bacteria or the biofilm in eliminating that for the, for the, sorry, can you hear me? Hello? 
Yes. Yes, you're very audible. It doesn't seem to want to skip to the next slide. I don't know why. It's just technical glitches. It, it will be fine. There we go. And um, so, so what is the motivation behind that? It's to combine our collective intelligence in the dental practices. It is to adapt to the patient's needs um, and to eliminate disease, of course, to, to modify the tools that they need during, that, during their lifetime, because it obviously changes as their needs change. And it's to reverse um, the, the damage that might have occurred already and to restore it and to substitute um, disease with health. That is why we, this is our aim of this continuum from life uh, to death. Um, as I said, it's an interdisciplinary collaboration with the dental professionals um, liaising with the patient's medical team. It's that collective intelligence of the whole dental team in the treatment of the patient. It's to combine the efforts between clinicians and the patients as well. So be proud of your mouth and, and the, the simple but very powerful message is to value and take care of your mouth. And that's what we try and instill within our patients. I cannot stress um, enough the uh, medical history that we need to take at every single visit because it's ever changing. And um, unfortunately, most of us do have a busy day and we get stuck into a patient and we very often don't take that minute or two to discuss it with the patient. So it's not just the history, it's also what's happening present with that patient. And you can't presume because a patient is eight years old, they don't have a medical history. You need to ask when you see a patient first, doesn't matter what age they are, discuss it with the parents. And of course, adjust your instruction to the patient according to their medical history. So I just want to perhaps mention a few diseases that we come into contact with regularly on a daily basis. And we don't often realize how it's affecting um, you know, our patients and of course, how it's affecting the oral health of the patient. So the first one here is a new approach to Addison's disease, oral manifestations due to endocrine dysfunction and comorbidity burden. So it's a study they did on patients with celiac disease. And with celiacs, you find that it manifests with xerostomia, with dry lips, with um, aphthous stomatitis, dental enamel defects in children, and a very high prevalence of caries and dentine sensitivity and gingival bleeding. So quite a few number of patients will say, oh, I've got celiacs and we just carry on. But they actually have a lot of um, symptoms that we can watch out for in the patient's mouth. Um, the observance then of um, Mirage in a large registry of patients um, that was on tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors. So it's, it's an anti-inflammatory uh, medication that they give to, to patients really um, who have um, bad osteoarthritis and a lot of the juvenile arthritis as well. And it seems to have an effect on the patient's um, bone. So when you're doing implants for patients, make sure that you ask them if they haven't taken any medication for osteoarthritis. So osteonecrosis of the joint patients with inflammatory bowel disease was also treated and um, you find that it affects the, the implants. Um, a lot of patients are on SSRIs and it's associated with an increased risk of implant failure. And it seems to have an effect on the bone remodeling and leads to excessive osteoporosis, a study that was done in 2021, June. <coughs> Sorry. So um, patients with a history of bisphosphonate treatment, um, also have this uh, med medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, the marange. Um, that was a study that they did also in 2021, June. So when a patient um, goes for any 
um, surgical procedures, it's very important to find out if they've had a bisphosphonate treatment. This is one of my patients that I'm sharing with you here. She has osteonecrosis of the jaw. As you can see there, the bone is actually showing in the floor of her mouth. She went for a um, apisectomy and um, they did it under sedation. And the surgeon never asked her about her medical history and she had taken bis by, um, bisphosphonates. And uh, he decided to extract the tooth under the sedation. So when she came out, she had one tooth missing. And then this was the result. And she's in severe pain. And she's been, she has spent thousands of rands going from one doctor to the next. And a simple question, are you on any bisphosphonate treatments would have prevented this from happening. So it's very important. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we're going to go to pregnancy. So literally when you start out and one of your patients are pregnant, discuss the proper nutrition with your pregnant patients. Um, the first trimester is very important um, because that's when your baby teeth start actually forming. And if the patient is purging, it depletes the calcium phosphate mineral stores and it's not bioavailable to the fetus. So discuss the um, nutrition uh, with them. Make sure, of course, about pregnancy gingivitis. That's always something to look out for. And, of course, dietary changes as well. So a study that was done, 40% um, of pregnant ladies had no dental care or access to care, only went for pain relief. And... Um, I think that seems to be a worldwide trend. So I think the findings was that the attitudes and the significant are the de significant determinants of accurate knowledge and current practice. And a multidimensional approach is needed to increase access to dental care to the uh, pregnant ladies. And I think it's always about um, the finding that they said was the knowledge of the appropriateness of procedure continues to lag in, in the dental um, practices. So very often we would focus only on um, you know, gingivitis, but there's many aspects to pregnancies that needs to be taken into account. So some ladies develop hypertension during their pregnancies and um, the acetazolamide that's administered during pregnancy can have a result on the tooth formation. So the result, it results in um, <clears throat> oligodontia, which is uh, six or more teeth missing. And, um, you know, it's very important because that's the formation stage. So find out what medication your pregnant patients are on. So we now go to when a baby's born. Um, a lot of them are born with um, tongue ties and um, it's a congenital condition where the lingual frenum extends beyond its normal location towards the tip of the tongue. So about four to six percent of babies are affected. And um, I think it's important to tell your patients to watch out for the tongue ties or the, or the lip ties, the frenums on the upper, on the maxilla because it prevents the baby from latching during breastfeeding. <coughs> so here you can see what it looks like on the pictures. Um, it's, it's very short. And it, if you look at the picture on the, on the lower part of the screen, the picture on the left-hand side will show you what a normal tongue position looks like. And you can see how nicely it pushes against the palatal bone plates, whereas the tongue tie is very short and the bone plates are not flattened out by the tongue, the pressure of the tongue. So very often they also struggle to breastfeed when they have tongue ties um, or lip ties. Um, there's a bifunctional soothers that is available in South Africa. 
And um, it's a special soft silicone that creates the same pleasant sensation as a natural nipple. And um, it's unlike conventional dummies in that it has a flat tip and it gives the palate space so that it does not take an abnormal high arch shape. And it prevents this open bite that you often see with the children that um, do suck dummies. So this particular soother stops a vacuum from forming in the mouth and it prevents malalignment or misalignment and supports optimal breathing. And uh, through the nose, of course, instead of through the mouth, because the mouth breathing really dries out and is very prone to decay the children who mouth breathe. And um, so this, this particular um, soother also um, has the suction pressure that ensures that the dental arches develop in a nice round shape. And um, it was developed by a doctor, um, Herbert Pick, um, because his son developed a crossbite. And uh, only about 20% of the jaw malformations are genetic, says Dr. Pick. So the rest is really up to us to, to give information to our pregnant parent, patients and also to um, when they have newborns. So special tools to start with a baby to get them accustomed to and cleaning their teeth is little uh, finger brushes. Um, and of course, an age appropriate toothpaste, um, floss fingers for if they get a bit older to want to floss the teeth and the little kiddies irrigators, which is nice to use like a, a water pick, a kiddies water pick. Safety is of course, always first. So select your food grade silicone. Uh, make sure it's, it's uh, BPA free. And of course, it's always a bonus if it's a planet friendly packaging that you buy your products in. Um, when the baby does use a soother or any of the plastics, make sure that it's, it's not perished and that uh, the plastic is still in the, or the silicone is still in a good condition. So, <clears throat> sorry, the disease which needs attention. Um, is a 2017 publication. And as we all know, early childhood caries is a big problem, uh, a global problem. So 50% of children around the globe suffer from dental caries. Um, the Western Cape stats, I think, is, is more than 50%. And of course, we all know this affects their chewing, their speech, their psychosocial environment, and the quality of life for the patient, but also for the family, because often they have pain and they have swelling and fever, and it affects the families as well, because you obviously have to care for them. So treatment of dental caries is expensive in all countries, yet prevention is very simple and very effective. And I hope that, you know, we as hygienists and dentists can inspire our patients to do the preventative so that they don't have to spend the money. And of course, the most common reason for this is nighttime bottle drinking and sugar. That's a no-no. And we have to educate our patients regarding those matters. So your kiddies brushes should be very soft, um, not to cause damage to the enamel. And um, preferably, you know, the right size for the right age. And you, of course, also get um, electric options for the, your children. And then the kiddies irrigators is very nice for them to use, to clean. When it comes to toothpaste, um, hydroxyapatite toothpaste um, deposits the hydroxyapatite into the dentinal tubuli. So it does strengthen and build because obviously our teeth are made from hydroxyapatite. So it's a very nice um, option if one wants to go the natural route more than one wants to go perhaps the conventional route. So it's nice to, to consider. Um, if you look at the pictures on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, you'd prefer not to have that for your children or your grandchildren or any child, really. So um, if the pictures on the left is really what we aim for, to keep them healthy and, and smiling. 
So teenagers, um, hormonal changes happen, of course, in a teenager body. And um, that comes along with many challenges. And uh, one of the challenges is, of course, that the oral hygiene habits may change. Um, they become rebellious. They don't want to do what their parents want them to do. They have dietary changes. They have orthodontic issues and very strong emotional considerations. Um, I think anybody that's had a teenager can vouch for all of these problems. So the teen years are a critical period for acquiring peak bone strength. So your sex hormones, your growth hormones, your insulin-like growth hormones interact to modulate the changes in the bone size, in the geometry of the bone, the mineral content, and the microarchitecture that determines skeletal strength. So it's um, critical that we understand that um, that particular period of their, their lives and their oral hygiene needs to be excellent. Um, one thing that I'd like to address in the teenage years is perhaps, you know, the glamour that goes around piercings. And um, it's glamorized, of course, in the industry all around the world, but the reality is very different. You have a tongue piercing that's ripped out. You have recession of the um, gingival tissue with a, a lip um, ring. You, you see the, the breakage of the enamel where they wear the rings on their tongues and they play with it. The lingual recession, I've, had, I've seen all of these in practice as well. And the damage is of course irreversible with that amount of um, recession on the, on the gingival tissue. So educate your teenagers. You know, they think it's cool to have piercings, but they need to be educated to understand that damage can occur. So this is the list of the damage that can happen. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but it's really permanent and lasting damage to your teeth. It's um, inflammation and infection around it. You can choke on it. Um, you know, your tongue can get swollen and you can get a blocked airway. You can have scar tissue. Um, you can contract hepatitis or HIV from non-sterile instrumentation. Um, you can have endocarditis, Ludwig's angina, which is major swelling below the tongue and into the neck area, um, toxic shock, blood poisoning. So it's important to, to discuss it with a teenager. Even some adults have piercings. We, I mean, we, they, there's a lot of people who, who wear piercings, but it's important to tell them uh, what can happen. So a study that was done in 2020, and this was the outcome, 46.8% said that they had not been informed about the risks. And that's uh, rather negligent on, on our side. 48% um, claimed not to have cleaned the piercing, 70% stated that they'd not been made aware of the gingival problems that can arise. 60% um, subjects stated that they were not informed about the complications of piercings concerning their teeth. 58%, sorry, 52% had insufficient oral hygiene conditions. 42% uh, showed signs of generalized gingivitis. 20% had two to three millimeters recession and 22% had tooth fracture and due to the piercing. So it's a large percentage of um, preventable things that, that um, you know, people needn't have suffered if, if we had spent more time on our education with our teenagers. The orthodontics issues that um, faces the teenagers, of course, is also very big. You can see the swelling of the gingival tissue there, the hypertrophic tissue there. Um, laser normally seems to help that. The oral hygiene is extremely difficult and um, we need to inform them and give them the correct tools, whether it's an electric brush or a single brush or solo brush. Um, interdental brushes, floss threaders, and of course, some mouthwash will also help 
the oral irrigators is a nice one to use, but you preferably want to see this kind of result in your patient where they have good healthy gums while they're doing orthodontic treatment. So the water pick works really well, or sorry, it's, it's a brand, but we all know it's an oral irrigator. So it doesn't really matter what brand it is as long as the patients are able to clean around the brackets. Young adults, um, there's something called a Rosenberg self-esteem assessment scale, which is helpful um, to, to assess your adolescent behavior. And um, it's a 10 item scale that measures your global self-worth by measuring both positive and negative feelings about yourself. And it's basically works on strongly agree to strongly disagree. And I think it's a nice tool for us, maybe not ask the patient to fill it in, but if you can ask the relevant questions, you can understand how they um, see the, the oral hygiene, the oral health, and how they esteem it as part of their self-worth. And they found that um, the teenagers that have, or the young adults that have good self-worth actually does a lot more self-care with their oral health. So this is just, um, that's the Rosenberg scale. So it's basically strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and it's a 10 pointer. So um, you can look it up if you take it down and just see how you can substitute it with dental questions in there. So the other problem that we have is of course drugs and um, drug abuse in young adults and in adults. And, and the study was really um, in 2022, it was published. Cannabis users age 12 to 15. And I put in their older people as well, because I have patients in their seventies who still smoke cabin cannabis. And uh, we have to watch out for the same uh, side effects that we would watch out for in, in the young adults and adults. So there's an increased risk of bruxism, um, oral lesions, um, and of course, with frequent consumption of sugary beverages and snacks, because when people smoke cannabis, they get the munchies. And so they eat um, unhealthy snacks. Um, so we should really probe into um, the drug use habits and be cognizant of the increased risk of oral health problems with patients that actively use cannabis. Once again, I think um, social media makes it quite glamorous, but the effect is this. Um, the picture on the top right is the floor of the mouth where you can see there's changes in the soft tissue from cannabis use. The, the bottom right picture is um, vaping, the results of vaping and neglect. And on the left-hand side is uh, an esophagus with Barrett's disease. And they directly uh, related that to the use of cannabis for this particular patient. So um, oral problems do not represent an immediate risk of death, but they are responsible for um, quality of life of individuals as they prolong state of pain and suffering. And um, our actions should be focused on health education with the emphasis on self-perception, self-protection and self-care that should be explored. And um, you know, when you, when you go into adulthood, you start with multiple dental issues. Most people have. They've had restorative work done. They've had endodontics, rehabilitation of the occlusion and due to braxing, periodontitis, gingivitis, tooth loss, implantology, orthodontics. And I think we've all seen an x-ray like this with a multitude of things going on in that patient's mouth. And so the, the issues here is very difficult to, to clean a mouth like this for a patient at home takes really, really good self-discipline because it's not easy. And we have to work at every appointment they come in 
to show them to do it properly. With the seniors and, and uh, aging patients, the functional impairment and age-related diseases have a significant impact on their oral health. And it leads to, of course, poor quality of life. And the dental issues become more prevalent in older adults, partly as a result of their poor general health. And then, of course, everybody is on a handful of medication, and that has side effects. And um, often people, the, the aging or the seniors, have limited access to good dental care. Their nutritional status change because they seem to be fed in retirement homes a lot of high carbohydrate diets. Um, they have depression, they take medication for that, they end up with dry mouth. Um, their dexterity changes because they might have Parkinson's. So th there's, a, there's a very challenging time for people. Um, and we have to be cognizant of all of those challenges that they face. I want to brag a little bit with this one. She's a 97-year-old patient of mine. And she had all her upper implants done at the age of 80, which everybody said to her, you're absolutely crazy to do this. And she has maintained every three months for the last, uh, what's it now, 17 years. And this is the result of a 97-year-old who takes care of her mouth and she understands the value that it has for her. So there was a term that was um, coined now in Japan in 2020. It's called oral frailty. And oral frailty is, frailty, sorry, is, is defined as a decrease in oral function, but it's accompanied with a decrease in mental and physical functions. So the study showed that people with oral frailty are at high risk of phys physical frailty, sarcopenia and severe conditions requiring nursing care and death. So there's a loss of skeletal muscle mass and a, a loss of strength as a result of the aging. There's declining hormones, there's neuromuscular problems, there's increased inflammation. And um, yeah, we can change that by um, the importance or stressing the importance to patients of their oral health linking to their general health and achieving longevity and cutting down uh, inflammation. Because if we have inflammation in the oral cavity, it's, it spills into the rest of the body. A study that was done, and this was quite an interesting study to, to read, is the relationship between oral and gut microbial uh, microbiota in elderly patients. So the prevalence of oral bacterial transition to gut may be higher in the elderly than in the adults. So they found, um, they did stool samples of the mouth, uh, stool samples and samples of the mouth. And then they found that it was the exact bacteria that was present. So the, if, if you can keep the, the elderly patient's mouth healthy, of course, it will, it will stop the, the gut problems. So the medically compromised patient is also something that we experience in, in, our, in our daily practices. I had a patient today, um, she's 87. She had pristine oral hygiene and um, she has now developed um, Alzheimer's and has developed a love for sugary um, jam. And it is so sad because she only has about six teeth left in her mouth from having this pristine mouth to totally decayed. And um, it's because she's become medically compromised um, I've shown the carers, but they just find it very difficult because of her condition. She doesn't allow them in her mouth. So it's important that we work closely with the carers, with the rest of the health team, and we should be prepared to manage emergencies, of course. And it's very important to do emergency training at your practice on a regular basis. Um, 
So the clinical implications for us is that many of the elderly, elderly people have a variety of systemic diseases that can impact their oral health care. And um, the dentist may need to consult with the patient's physician to develop an appropriate treatment um, plan. So the holistic or biological options in dental care is something that's increasingly requested by our patients. Patients very often come in and say, I don't want to use, you know, toothpaste just off the shelf um, because they have various reasons for that. And um, there's a greater awareness of, of allergic or toxic ingredients in it in its lifestyle choices people make. And of course, it's also a planet friendly option. So um, we need to be aware when we give people information about the planet friendly options. I'm not going to talk products specifically. I think each person needs to do a bit of um, investigation. There are good products on the market um, that people could use. So um, do some investigation. But I want to give you a warning that very often the packages on um, biological or holistic products will say green chemistry um, or naturally derived ingredients. Um, so it also says no cheap natural ingredients or fillers. So no man-made, they say it's safer, man-made safer preservatives and um, green washing. So leading with natural ingredients and then slipping in a bunch of things. So um, we need to be careful um, when we read the labels of these particular products that we're not giving people something that is um, toxic to them. I think what you should really look out for on, on, on uh, biological uh, products is to have unrefined, cold-pressed, non-irradiated, nutrient-dense, plant and mineral-based, and certified organic and pesticide-free, hexane-free, and um, of course, sustainably sourced, and um, glass packaging, if possible, and, and good manufacturing practice. So there's things that you can read on the labels that you have to teach your patients to, to read it properly. I think very often people rush out and buy products and it's actually detrimental to their oral health. So the correct labels will be these things. So dental self-care is a health adherence model. And that is, I think, our whole aim is to create this relationship with your patient where you secure this therapeutic alliance between yourself and the patient. And um, you increase your patient confidence and their self-efficacy. They need to understand that um, they need to do it as much as you need to do your work. They need to do their part at home. And it's really about sitting with the patient and instructing them. Um, I, I often say instruction and instructions are two different things. Instructions you can read on a pamphlet. Um, but instruction means I sit with my patient, I show them in their mouths, I show them how to do it, and I let them practice. That is instruction. So um, by doing that, you expand your patient knowledge about their health condition and they become um, self-caring. So what is our take-home message? is to use excellent quality brushes, floss, et cetera, whatever you think the patient needs for their particular condition, but make sure it's quality. Not a traumatic tools and techniques. Um, there are many products out there that are very harsh and very traumatic to the dentition. Please avoid that. Make sure that your tools are effective, that you're teaching the patient, and that they should have in, they should enjoy what they're using. They need, for them to be compliant, they need to enjoy what they're using. And to expand our knowledge, um, that benefits the, the total outcome of your patient care. So enjoy your oral health. Teach your patients to love their mouths, to love their smiles, 
And um, I want to leave you with this. Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. And the way you make others feel is your trademark. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alna, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think right earlier on, we had just one question. So I'll go straight into the question and we'll have another Q&A at the end of the session. I think there was uh, interest in the dummies that you were referring to. So they just wanted to know where they can be purchased. I'm seeing only one question. If there are more questions, they can also type. I don't know if you can take us through that. Um, those dummies you can order from Curaprox SA. Okay. Thank you so much. And I really want to thank you for taking us on a continuum from birth to death of oral health. You know, it's quite critical at what level you intervene, because depending on where you're going to intervene and how you intervene as an oral health practitioner will really have an impact on the oral health trajectory of your individual. Thank you for linking with the systemic conditions and how it affects oral health and re-emphasizing the importance of taking proper medical history. And I think what we also need to emphasize is proper record keeping because it's quite critical. I want to thank you for defining again, the role we have as oral health practitioners in antenatal and postnatal care, and also indicating the tools that we can actually use. Uh, and for the teenagers, uh, we have a lot of participants and I'm sure some of them have teenagers. Thank you. I actually wanted to take uh, a picture so that we can share with, 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 with our teenagers because as you say, they think it's cool, but it could actually have long lasting damaging effects. Uh, I, I really could go on, but I think my take home as well is also about self-care, which has to do as well uh, with health from oral health promotion. So, so thank you for bringing that to life. And I think also just making sure that you, you, you improve the oral health related quality of life of your patients. And you can brag about your 97 year old patient. She really <laughs> looks very good. So thank you very much for that. Without further ado, uh, we will then, let me see. I think we could have another question. Um, <laughs> then they also want to know where to purchase the pacifiers. Yeah, it's Curaprox SA. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, we will then move on to our next presenter, uh, who is our influencer, Dr. Rohini Bissal. Dr. Rohini Bissal is a qualified dentist, graduated from the University of the Western Cape in 2017. She was also part of the Golden Key Society during her academic career. She is currently in her fifth year of private practice, situated in Balita. And then I was there in, de in December, beautiful. Uh, with a great passion and keen interest in dentistry as a whole. She is a general dentist offering treatment ranging from general dentistry to clear braces, smile makeovers and teeth whitening to name a few. Community is a huge part of her life which she builds using her social media presence. Therefore engaging and providing necessary dental information on her dental page and works with brands in general on her personal page. She balances her professional life as a dentist and a part-time model influencer to not only break the barrier of having multiple careers, but she thrives in both. She believes strongly in encouraging the youth of today, especially females, to always aspire towards their dreams regardless of what society may deem correct. Aside from her personal pursuits, she is keen on working with the Young Dental Council to reach out to the young dentists and share knowledge uh, and help with overall guidance and development. On a personal level, she has a history of pageantry, Miss India, South Africa, First Princess 2016. Congratulations, uh, Miss Uniworld Brand Ambassador 2018. International Modeling and Dancing, shot for the cover of Get It magazine in the North Coast 2020 and was on many TV and radio interviews when she's not actively working on her career. She loves spending quality time with family, reading, listening to podcasts and going on adventures. What a beautiful bio. How are you? Welcome. 
Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you so much. <laughs> So we're going to be in conversation. There are some questions that we received that I'm going to uh, go through with you. So if you can really just indulge us. Uh, I'll think I'll start with the, um, the first one. We've highlighted the significance of World Oral Health Day, but can you just elaborate a bit more on it? Okay, so let's let's be real and let's just be honest with each other. As dancers, we're not the most, how can I say, the, our go-to people, right? Um, so essentially, by creating that awareness with World Oral Health Day and so on, it essentially is, well, creating an awareness in a mindful and a friendly manner will not only decrease the overall anxiety and negative association with regards to going to the dentist, but it would also encourage the public as a whole to take the leap and go for their regular dental checkups. I mean, something as small as a minor filling that is needed can be prevented into getting exacerbated into something with a root canal, for example. So with those small dental checkups or your six monthlies in general, to encourage people um, and, and basically motivate them to see their dentist will prevent the onset of unlikely events. So essentially, I would say that is one of the biggest things for me to highlight World Oral Health Day and basically reach out to the public as a whole. Um, so yeah, I think that is the biggest thing for me. And basically, it also decreases the cost for the patient as well. You are correct. There, there is a psychological, economic impact to maintaining good oral health. So thank you for that. Now, our influencer, if we could have some tips, five key important factors pertaining to a healthy oral uh, environment. Sure. So the basic one is, you know, encouraging your patients to book in for their six monthly checkups. Sometimes if it's a period patient, your four monthly checkups. And a good way to make sure they, they come through for that is booking them in advance to ensure that they actually make those appointments because it's very easy to forget about those. The second one I find is very important. If you are eating or drinking anything, or while well, eating in general, always rinse with some water thereafter to neutralize the oral environment. I think we take for granted that water is such a basic tool to just you know rinse out the mouth and neutralize the area. So that is one thing I always, always tell my patients. And then flossing use and using incidental aids. I think there's so many incidental aids out there on the market nowadays, which is so wonderful to use. And a lot of the patients are not aware of how to use them. So I think demonstrating and encouraging them to use those incidental aids would be really, really great, especially for patients who are also undergoing their orthodontic treatments and using those maxi flosses and ortho picks. Those are really, really awesome as well. A healthy diet as well. Um, I think that is going to ensure that the teeth are also being nourished and kept strong and brushing the tongue. I think that's one thing that a lot of patients forget to do. And the tongue, obviously, it's a large surface area. So to prevent any unlikely or unwanted germs and plaque accumulation on that area. Thank you. And I think as you're very correct as well. I mean, when, when brushing as well, they must just make sure that they reach right at the back, you know, so that they can re remove the plaque accumulation there. So let's talk about the pedo patients. How can we encourage kids to maintain a healthy oral environment? Okay, so the biggest one I feel is parents can play such an important role. So demonstrating for the child how to correctly brush, and that obviously comes with educating the parents as well. Now, a child is most likely more inclined to listen to their parents than a stranger. So I think demonstrating that in the correct manner until they're the age of six, because obviously when after they turn six, they have that dexterity to brush on their own, etc. So learning from a young age will definitely enhance their capabilities and overall maintenance in the oral environment. And putting on brushing videos or child-friendly videos is one that I love playing for the kids that I treat as the Peppa Pig goes to the dancers. So finding those little clips that will, you know, get the patient or the child involved and wants to brush their teeth is always, always a great thing. Um, and then one of the another things that I like suggesting is, you know, a kid's not going to really stand there and brush for two minutes. So I always ask the patient, you know, what is the what is the kid's favorite song? And you play that in the background, and you know, they they drive to the song. Obviously, you're making sure that they also brush correctly, but it's also a nice way to make it fun, make it interactive, and so the kid gets used to that that routine. And then also teaching them about cavities and why cavities are so bad. I think the one thing that we always, we instill fear in kids, where we're like, 
you know, if you're going to get a cavity, it's going to be bad for you and so on and so forth. But we need to educate them on why it's bad. Yes, they're going to have a second chance with their permanent dentition. However, we need to ensure that that doesn't happen with their, per well, with their permanent dentition after the primary dentition is affected. So it's just those small little things that will really, really help the pedo patients. Thank you so much. And, and I think <laughs> as well, I can see some of the students from Sefako Makato Health Science University as I, I hear as well. They're also saying that we need to do TikTok videos. So we must familiarize ourselves with social media. I don't That's know how great. good I'll be, but, <laughs> but we must move with the times, isn't it? Now let's talk Yeah. Now let's talk halitosis. Uh, how it occurs and what factors contribute to it? Look, obviously, I think that Elna elaborates on it so, so well, especially when she spoke about celiac disease and so on and so forth. And I think that that's one thing we can educate our patients about, especially when patients come in, and especially the one thing I see is a lot of diabetic patients. And they always complain about the halitosis and the dry mouth, et cetera. And then educating them as well to tell them exactly why it occurs I mean, the impaired healing as well with diabetic patients, that all contributes to halitosis in general. And also our diet. Uh, I think that's also a very good factor. As much as we are dentists, we can also encourage good oral, well, not oral, good diets or, or good intake of healthy foods because that's obviously the portal to our entire body. So those small little things will definitely, you know, enhance the oral environment and also just help with the maintenance and, and, you know, halitosis in general. And of course, you know, your, your good oral health practices and brushing techniques and so on. And I think, you know, we always go on about brushing correctly, but showing them, example, for example, the modified bath technique, how to utilize their toothbrush, how to get into those hard to reach spaces. That will, all those small things will definitely contribute to, you know, enhancing the oral environment and keeping it nice and healthy. Thank you very much. And, and I mean, you're also correct. Elna really elaborated a lot on the interdental aids and how to optimally use them. So I'll just move on to the next question. I'm noting that two hands, I will take them at the end. So please just be patient with us. If you can just elaborate on underlying diseases that may contribute to a compromised oral health. Sure. So as Elna also elaborated very in depth, um, there's a few that I'm just going to mention briefly that I, I specifically see, which are the common ones, right? Diabetes, definitely. Um, that's one of the biggest ones. I had a patient the other day that came through and she she complained about having that sweet and, you know, uncomfortable breath that she smells all the time. And then, you know, you look at the history and you're like, okay, diabetic patient. And then, when we, you know, it, it goes back into our theory and so on, where we learn about ketotic breath due to a patient presenting with diabetes. So it's all those small little things that we need to consider. You know, it's the smallest things and the patient is unaware of it, right? Um, also osteoporosis, that affects, you know, the bone levels and the bone health in general. And obviously bone loss and mobile teeth contribute to that. So that's also a huge one that we need to consider. I also do find that it, it's a genetic predisposition as well, where patients, parents also have bone loss and so on. So we need to consider that as well. Um, cancers as well, if a patient's also undergoing chemo and radiotherapy, that definitely also affects the bone levels. And overall, their immunity is very low. So fighting off any sort of bacteria and diseases in the mouth, it becomes a bit more difficult for those patients. And overall, immunocompromised patients as well. So, you know, if a patient presents with a, a condition where their immune system is fighting against them, that definitely is also going to exacerbate any sort of oral diseases and and unwanted infections in the mouth as well. Definitely. And I also think that there is, I mean, a link that is established between low birth works and, and periodontal disease and cardiovascular disease as well. So sure. there is a huge link between general health and, and oral health. And that brings me to a multidisciplinary team that we should always aspire to have now let's talk about change, the Obama moment. How can we as a dental as dental professionals encourage good oral health and create a positive change within the dental realm? Okay, so this is one of my favorite things that I love doing and I, I'm very, very passionate about it as well. So 
you know, we as dentists, we need to be the change now. I mean, dental trauma and dental fear is still very prominent. And I'm sure everyone can agree as well that patients come in and they are just so fearful and they have these, these stories that they've experienced and the trauma that they've experienced at the dentist and so on. And I think our responsibility comes in where it can be in chair with the patient and being approaching it in a manner where the patient feels comfortable and you feel the patient feels that they can approach you in a friendly manner and also doing I mean these these talks and interviews and basically creating an awareness about dental health and the profession as a whole will definitely help and I think also one of the biggest things is going and embarking on community projects with schools I think starting off at, at a young age with the kids is going to allow for a brighter future in the dental realm. So they grow up not having that dental fear. A lot of patients that I see, I see their parents are more fearful than the, to, with the dentist than the actual kid, which is a game changer. And I think that's really great. But I think starting off from a young age and encouraging them and basically getting them familiar with the dentist is always, always a great thing. And yeah, outreach programs are always a good thing and community building programs. And I think as dancers, lastly, if we can come together as a team, even if it's the young dancers, dancers or, you know, all the dancers together and we all work together and work on projects, I think that can really, really help overall in our profession. I think our profession is so beautiful. I do think it's underrated. And I think as a team, we can really, really change it up in such a positive manner. Thank you, and thank you for your energy. It is a, a beautiful, beautiful career. It is really inspiring to see what the YDC is doing. And as, as you said, I mean, in, in your bio, you're diverse, and you are basically uh, conquering in all spheres, and it really shows, and you're quite, quite motivational. I've got two questions. I'll ask all the presenters, just be on standby. Uh, so that we can direct the questions. The first one is from Togen Chita. If you can uh, maybe unmute and ask your question, we'll appreciate. Okay, nothing is coming from my side. If you're finding it difficult, would you kindly just type your question in the in the Q and A? And then Leslie Foster, are you able to unmute? Okay, I will ask them to, to type the, the questions in the Q&A. And whilst we, we have the, the speakers back. Okay, Sada head office. Um, yes, unmute. Yes, if we could, un are you able to unmute Leslie Foster? Unfortunately not. They will need to send the questions okay. in the Q&A. Okay, thank you. It would have been loved you to hear the voices, but please just send the, the questions in the Q&A. And then we'll read them out. And even if we you send them, what we'll just make sure, we'll make sure that we get back to you uh, with the, the answers to your Q&A. I think there were about three uh, participants who had uh, questions that they wanted to ask. So Rohini, any parting shots, parting words that you would like to share with the youth and the elderly? Well, I think it's just, as, I, as I've just mentioned, it's, it's such a beautiful career. We have so much to offer as professionals. And it's just, it's lovely. I mean, meeting you, meeting other professionals in the dental realm and just coming together and working together as a team. I think it's, it's wonderful. And I really, really do encourage the young dancers and even aspiring dancers. I mean, I, I get so many messages on a daily where there's people that are interested in the profession and so on. But I also do feel your heart has to be in the right place. 
you got to be willing to help patients. You've got to be willing to put in the time and the effort and remember the purpose and remember the oath that you took as a dentist when you qualified. I think going back to that, it's always going to humble you and it's always going to motivate you to do better in your profession. So I think that's that's one thing that I would always want to spread and always want to encourage the young dentists and dentists as a whole. And I think it's, it's just those small little reminders that are are important. Thank you very much. I guess it's to be the change that you really want to see. And I can't re-emphasize the impact that oral health professionals actually have. I mean, without your teeth, you cannot, you can't smile. It helps you to eat. It helps you to chew, you know, so that it's very, very important for us to value our oral health and assist our patients in attaining uh, the best oral health that they can have. Uh, Elna? Would you like to say a few words before we close the, the webinar? Thank you, Rahini, I'm inspired. Yes, I would like to thank everybody that participated tonight. It, I think, was a great success. And I think the enthusiasm that we carry for our profession um, is something that we can infect our patients with, you know. So hopefully um, they would return to our practices because we have, taken and gone the extra mile with them. So to be proud of their oral health, to be proud of their smiles and um, for us to participate in that process with them. So yeah, just for them to enjoy smiling, you know, it gives them confidence and it, um, it certainly does yeah, light up your face when you have a good smile. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> and it, it's thank infectious you. and contagious. So yes. I'm also very happy with the, the participants. We had a great turnout and I'd like to thank each and every person who really took time out uh, to come and, and share uh, this webinar uh, with us. So before we close, uh, I would like to really thank the most, uh, the, the office, uh, Marilise, Tepo, Norma, you're always there to assist us and help us. I want to thank our speakers once more. We are now well informed and we know about gut health. We know about all the systemic conditions that are related to oral health. We know what the youth or the, the YDC is actually doing out there. And it's very encouraging for the, for the, for the profession to see that we really have vibrant people moving the profession forward, taking the baton. So we're really proud of Rohini. And when I started, I said, I have beautiful ladies on the panel. You can, you can see for yourselves. I'd also like, as I started, also thank the participants for staying with us. I know some of us have now gone into low shedding, but at least we've managed to stay through for the entire time of the webinar. And once again, I'd like to thank Sara for helping us with the platform and Sensodyne uh, for sponsoring us for this particular uh, webinar. And as I said, we launched oral, World Oral Health Day on the 20th, but for us oral health practitioners, it's every day. The campaign is every day. Rohini has indicated how you can then start working with the community, start collaborating as oral health professionals so we can take this profession forward. I am noting that we have more questions. Uh, we have from Leslie. Uh, apologies, I accidentally clicked the raise hand option, but I take this opportunity to thank both speakers for their excellent presentation and enthusiasm. We thank you for accidentally uh, raising your hand. Uh, and then we have an anonymous attendee. So great to see such passion and enthusiasm for the profession. Thank you. Our very good uh, friend, Betty Lowe, who has had many projects. Uh, wonderful to see young dentists being so enthusiastic. I'm not so young anymore, but still very enthusiastic. Yes, we know you're very enthusiastic. And thank you for taking the time uh, to send us a message. Always good to hear and see from you, Betsy. We've done quite a bit of work together. Uh, there is a question from another attendee. Uh, can genetics alone make you more susceptible to dental caries? Who would you like to answer? <laughs> you can start. <laughs> um, I, I would possibly say no. Um, depending on whether the child was born with 
um, a genetic hyperplasia or you know sp specific conditions that would make them susceptible to decay. But if you care for a toddler's teeth in the way that you should, dental caries is completely avoidable. I'm not. I'm not talking about um, you know. If if somebody is born with a with an abnormality, that's that's a different challenge. But if you're born with healthy teeth, the best way to look after them is to clean them, and to make sure that you get the necessary tools to help you in that in that situation. I don't know if Rohini has something to say about it. So I okay, do agree I'll... with you as well, Elna. I, I do feel as if that if you really take care of the oral environment and you are a bit more cognizant of what you need to do, you can definitely prevent dental caries completely. I 100% agree. Okay. I think we, we really concur. And I think what is important that you've said is the fact that there are some congenital uh, conditions that can predispose somebody more to, to dental caries. And then you may find that when you're looking at the epidemiology of dental caries, you may find that the, there are some host factors or even um, host factors that can make the person or environmental factors that can make it more susceptible. But when it comes to the old saying, they used to say, I, uh, bad teeth run in our family. If you change that perception to say that you're going to take care of your teeth, make sure you remove the plug, then you can just say that there is really not such a big link between genetics and, and dental caries because you're both bright ladies. If you clean your teeth, remove the plaque, remove the agent, you should be able to prevent dental caries, which is a largely preventable disease. That is why we're so worried that a lot of people suffer from it and it causes a lot of pain and discomfort, which is not necessary. Thank you. I hope you've answered your question. I think that was... If we then move on to the other question. Okay, the question is, please, can you just say again, if it is medicine for osteoarthritis that has an effect on implants? Um, yes. So it's, it's, a, it's medication that they give to patients with, with osteoarthritis, and it's um, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and it um, has an effect on the bone, um, and therefore implants fail. We've had it in our practice where the implants actually failed, and um, we weren't aware that the patient was taking that particular medication. So, um, yes, it's, um, it's an anti-inflammatory drug that they give to patients, and also patients that have um, uh, chemotherapy. Um, also, it has a similar effect on the on the bone formation and the bone integration with the implant. So, it's important to take a full medical history, um, past and present, of the patient before you even embark on implantology. Okay, thank you. I think that's well covered. Um, I think we can't reemphasize the need for proper, proper medical history. And we should be collaborating with, the, with our other medical colleagues, especially uh, when they, they, have, um, they have patients who are going to undergo chemotherapy so that there could be some prevention of the osteosarcomas. All right. Uh, we have a compliment from Minette Westcom. Uh, your smile is an advert for good oral health. Take your pick. Thank you. I think that's for all of us. Uh, and we thank Minette for that. Um, I think that is that is all for now. Those are the questions that I'm seeing. And I think we've covered quite a, a lot of information. And it would be very nice to actually have another webinar with you ladies. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time with you. And let me not take you more from your families. So with that, I thank you. I thank Sarah, our sponsors, our speaker, and our participants. And I say good night. Thank you, Ms. McCorker. Thank you, Sada, and, and thank you, Saint Sudan. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. I'm still waiting for the TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just wait for the participants to exit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Have a great evening further.
I will end the webinar now. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.